Consolidate down into groups of three or four. Uh, I think that should be best. No pairs, but at least three or four people in a group. And I'm going to come around and give everyone an object for your group, and then I'll explain what we're going to do. Okay. So what I want you to do now, and these are the only instructions you're going to get, so don't ask for any more instructions. I want you guys to play a game for five minutes, and at the end, I just want you to record who won the game. Go. <laughs> so what was that like? It was fun. It was a lot of fun to watch, I'll tell you that. How did you decide who would win? You made rules? Okay. What about the other groups? Made rules? Oh, that, oh, that's an easy way. Whoever had the ball when, when we called it, they knew the winner. Ours, Hot potato type thing. Ours was fun and humiliating because we were beaten by a woman. <laughs> There's no My wife used to make games all the time, so. <laughs> what was it like when I told you just to start playing without any other instructions? Creative. You had to be creative? You had to think of something? Yes. You couldn't just start playing? Why not? Say that a little louder. You needed rules. Why did you need rules? Hey, Either a structure progress. in order to progress, okay? A goal. A goal, sure. Adults need rules. I mean, we're used to rules, yeah, as adults. We're used to having to follow rules all the time. Something to win at the end. Say that one more time. Something to win at the end. Something to win at the end. You have to know how to get to that end right. point, sure. So, the difference between this game and our rules and <laughs> The church is that we agree on the rules that we have. Do you think that wasn't true in the early church? Well, <laughs> not right now. <laughs> so, so let's connect this then to the spiritual life. What what does this tell us about what it means to be a spiritual person? Do we have a goal? Yes. What's our goal? What's that? Heaven. Heaven, eternal life, happiness with God. So what does that say about how we get there? Can we just kind of do it loosey-goosey, whatever we want? No. You have, to have, you have to have a structure. You have to have a, a way to know if you're progressing on the path to your goal. You have to, for lack of a better word, have a score that you can kind of keep. To know, am I making progress? Am I getting to that point? Am I going to get there eventually? The point I want to make here, and if you can remember back 10 months, which is difficult for me, I know, when we did our little come and see, little six-minute snippets, the analogy that I gave for the precepts of the church was that they're like the boundary lines on a game field. They tell us what's in and out of bounds. They help us to have structure. They help us to know where we're at in the game. You can imagine playing a game like soccer or football without any lines. I mean, would that be a, a game that you could play with any sort of uh, consistency or with any sort of sense of what you're actually doing. I mean, we can, you don't have to have straight, you know, painted lines on a, on a grass field to do it. But, you know, even when kids go out, you know, you think of kids playing baseball, you know, they grab a rock or a mitt and that's, you know, first base, second base, whatever. You have to have the delineation. You have to be able to know what the playing field is. They tell us what's in and out of bounds. The rules of the church, the precepts of the church, 
are very similar. And, and in our conversations today, we're going to be using the term precepts of the church broadly. There are the official precepts of the church, but we're also going to be talking about the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, anything that gives us a structure for understanding spiritual life, anything that gives us an idea of how do we keep score on our way to heaven. And I, and I hope that's not too scandalous to say it that way. I mean, St. Paul talks about running a race, the end point of which is heaven. And so even in a race, you have to have marker points along the way so you know how far you've gone. So the idea of keeping track of where we are in our spiritual life isn't, shouldn't be so uh, displeasing to us as it might be about at first thought. Now, there's a big difference, though, between the way the church conceives of rules and the way our wider culture conceives of rules. Our modern culture isn't real big on rules. It isn't real big on being told what to do. And our modern culture... There's this conception that rules restrict our autonomy. And, and make no mistake, in our, our current culture that we're in, the highest good is personal autonomy. The idea that I can do whatever I want. That I can make choices for myself without restriction, without regard to anyone else imposing their ideas or their morality or anything else on me. In our cultural culture, that is the highest good that can be conceived of. And so any sort of restriction on that no matter how benign, is seen as something to push against. So this idea that rules constrict my personal autonomy and that they're an exercise of oppressive power. You know, there's this idea in our culture that any attempt to establish a rule or anything like that, well, that's someone trying to put their power over on me, and so I have to fight back against that. You know, we, we don't like being lorded over in our culture. But that's not the way the church and our faith conceives of our rules. And part of that is because we have this conception of the sovereignty of Christ. That Christ is Lord. And I don't think we always appreciate what a bold claim that is. To say that Jesus Christ is Lord. For two reasons. Number one, it was certainly scandalous at the time of Jesus. Because at the time of Jesus, who was Lord? Well, Caesar, certainly. But, but for the Jewish people, who is Lord? God. You know, that's why if you read your Old Testament, you oftentimes see the word Lord in small capital letters. That's because that's the name of God in the Old Testament. And the Jews had a practice of replacing that with the word Adonai, Lord, because you never said the, the name of God out loud. So anytime you see that in the Old Testament, that Lord in small capitals, that's the name of God. And it's indicating that God is Lord. So for Jesus then and the early Christians to make this claim that Jesus is Lord would have been scandalous to the Jewish people at the time because God is Lord. It's establishing that Jesus is God because if God is Lord and Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. So very scandalous. Yeah, also Caesar in, in the time of the, the New Testament certainly was seen as the Lord. Uh, if you've ever heard uh, Father Robert Baer talk about that, you know, he talks about just what a challenge that was against that culture to say that Jesus is Lord because for the, the Romans it was no Caesar is Lord. That was their slogan. Here comes these Christians saying, no, this, this Jewish peasant in, uh, in Jerusalem, he's Lord. Very different conception. So first that Jesus is sovereign, but then out of that comes freedom. And St. Paul is wonderful about this. St. Paul in his writings talks uh, quite a bit about freedom and what Christian freedom is. And for St. Paul, freedom comes uh, in two ways. First, there's freedom from. And the two big things for Paul that we have freedom from is sin and death. That because of Christ's paschal mystery, the death and resurrection of Christ, we have freedom from sin. We've been freed from sin. And because of that, the effects of original sin, which are this death. But now we have the promise of the resurrection, the promise of eternal life in Christ. But even more than just freedom from those things, we have freedom for other things in Paul's conception. And, and the two I want to leave you here today with, we have freedom for faith. We have the freedom to exercise our faith because of what Christ has done for us. Because Jesus is Lord, we have the freedom to believe. We have the freedom to follow him. And then because of that, because of the call of Christ, we have the freedom for service to one another. We have the freedom to serve one another, to love one another and the people in our community. That to Paul is the two great freedoms, the freedom from sin and death and the freedom for faith and service. He puts it this way in the letter to the Galatians. 
For you, you were called for freedom, brothers, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. So we have a responsibility to use our freedom wisely. And that's a great gift. To have that freedom to do these things. And it's our choice. This is a freedom granted to us by God. It's part of our nature as human persons. And it's meant to be used for good. That's why uh, when people like to challenge the church, well, if God was all-powerful, why did he create sinful human beings? Well, because he gave us freedom. He gave us the freedom to choose good and evil. He didn't impose it on us. He gave us that rational intellect to be able to make decisions. And that's what freedom is about. So let's talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments then. If Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is sovereign over all, if we kind of start with that as our starting place, it means that he is deserving of all our worship. If Jesus is Lord, he can demand everything of us. We just did some regional workshops for teachers and catechists around the diocese. Tom Quinlan, who's my counterpart up in the Diocese of Joliet, uh, came down. And I loved his, his way of phrasing this. He told the teachers and catechists that we should never tell children especially, you know, when they ask, well, why should I go to Mass? Or, you know, if they're misbehaving at Mass. Well, it's the least you can do for God to sit still for one hour out of the week. Have you ever said that? Yes. It's bad theology. It's bad catechesis. You know that. You know that. We say it anyway. I know. Tom's point, though, was that what a minuscule, pathetic conception of what we owe God. God has given us everything. God deserves every breath we take. God deserves everything back because God has given us everything. So Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they deserve all of our love, all of our worship. The Ten Commandments are connected to that. And it's not a connection we always make. We often think of the Exodus story as God rescuing the people out of Egypt so that they can go and conquer the Holy Land. That's really an oversimplification. And if you actually read Exodus and go to when uh, chapter 5, where Moses goes to Pharaoh and asks for the people to be released, this is what Moses actually says. And this is from uh, like I said, Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. Pharaoh answered, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. They replied, The God of the Hebrews has come to meet us. Let us go a three days journey in the wilderness, that we may offer sacrifice to the Lord our God. Well, it wasn't just to rescue the Israelites, it was to rescue them so they could go into the wilderness to worship God. That's what God was calling the people out of, it, out of Egypt for. Not just as a nice thing to do to rescue them, but so that they could come and worship God. And so if you keep that in mind when you read the whole Exodus story, it puts a whole different spin on things. That the people are being called out ultimately to Jerusalem, the ultimate place of worship at the temple there. The purpose was to bring them out so that they could worship together as a community in the way that God demanded. So the commandments then are to help the people in their journey towards right worship with God. It's to prepare them so they can live their lives, they can orient themselves towards God in such a way that they can offer fitting worship. So I want to show a little video here from Father Robert Barrett. This is one of his YouTube videos. And he's going to focus on the first table uh, of the Ten Commandments, or the first three commandments, and talk a little bit about how they orient us towards that right relationship with God. <laughs> so then let's talk a little bit about the precepts of the church. And, and it's interesting as we kind of developed the ideas for uh, the different presentations we were going to do over the course of this year. We wrestled with the precepts of the church and where we wanted to situate them uh, within the, the sequence of the topics. I don't know if the other staff members remember this or not, but 
we kind of vacillated between whether we wanted to do this at the beginning or if we wanted to do it at the end. You know, do we start with the precepts, do we start with the rules, or do we end with them? We decided to end with them in part because we thought it would be a lot easier that way, that everything that we've talked about over the course of these 10 months would kind of lead us towards these, so that by this point, hopefully we take a look at these and think, well, of course. I mean, this is, we shouldn't actually be doing all of these things because of our understanding of liturgy, because of our understanding of what it means to be reconciled with God, because of how we live our lives. Uh, so I'm actually not going to take a whole lot of time walking through the precepts and talking about them. We'll do some reflection here in just a little bit. Uh, but just a, a, a few remarks on them. When we really look at the precepts of the church, and these are the five precepts, they're in your booklet as well. When we stop and reflect on them, we realize they really are drawn out of that first table of the Ten Commandments. It's exactly what Father Barry was talking about. So it's about leading us towards proper worship of God. It's interesting, when you look up the precepts in the Catechism, the very first line under the, the, the title of precepts is this. The precepts of the church are set in the context of a moral life bound to and nourished by liturgical life. These precepts are bound to and nourished by liturgical life. And I wish Elliot was here to hear me say that, because I think mean, he'd probably stand up and applaud. But the whole idea here is that we cannot separate these precepts from our worship of God. We cannot separate the moral life from the liturgical life. They are here to guide us towards that right relationship. They're here to guide us towards proper worship. And so read in that light, I think we see that what the precepts are all about is giving us kind of a bare minimum. If we needed uh, you know, kind of a simple idea of what is, the, what is it that the very least that the church asks of me as a practicing Catholic, what's the very minimum that the church requires of me, this is the list right here. And you can see the pretty simple thing. You shall attend Mass on Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation and rest and serve my labor. You shall confess your sins at least once a year. You shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. Obligation. You shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church, and you shall help to provide for the needs of the church. If we had to give kind of a bare minimum definition of what a practicing Catholic is, this would be it. You do these things, you, know, you should have no problem saying, I am a practicing Catholic. Now, when we look at that, we can also say, though, well, what an impoverished sense of what it is to be a practicing Catholic. I mean, and, and I think the church would agree with that that this is the minimum, but we're called to so much more. And Deacon will probably touch on some of that when he talks about the Beatitudes this afternoon. The whole idea here is that this gives us the baseline. This gives us the bare minimum that we can say, you know, I'm doing what the church requires of me, regardless of what else is going on in my life. You know, if I'm going to Mass on Sundays, if I'm receiving, and it's interesting, I always think, we forget about this, that the attendance of Mass is separate from receiving the Eucharist. You know, we're required to always attend Mass, but we're not always required to receive Eucharist. And there may be times, you know, if we ate right before Mass, something like that, you know, the one-hour fast is open back, you know, when maybe we have to go to Mass and not receive Eucharist. But the whole idea is that at least once a year, and it's interesting when you look at the history of that, you know, there was a time when people were so removed from the Eucharist that people would go years without receiving. And so the Church, in her wisdom, I would say, said at least once a year during Easter, what an appropriate time to receive the Eucharist. During Easter, at least once a year during Easter, you should receive. I should, and that's why then they also established the once a year for reconciliation to facilitate that. You know, if you're not <laughs> properly disposed, that you at least once a year receive sacramental confession, so you can do that once a year uh, reception during Easter, and then the others as well. You can see these are all oriented towards helping us to give back to God what belongs to God. And even that last one, which helped to provide for the needs of the church, it's about recognizing that all we have is gift. Everything that we have properly belongs to God and should be returned to God. I think it's also interesting that these are all positive rules, by which I mean they tell us what we should do. They don't say what we shouldn't do. And you know, if you know anything about disciplining children and things, it's always better to give them positive rules than negative rules. Tell them what they should do. You can tell a kid, you know, don't run through the hallway. And then they can interpret that as, well, then it's okay to do somersaults down the hallway. So they say, well, don't do somersaults. Well, then they'll do cartwheels down the hallway. Instead, you tell them, we walk in the hallway. Stop talking about my family. <laughs> I was thinking of mine. <laughs> you know, when we can give kids positive options to tell them this is what you should do instead of just saying no, 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 
you know, then they know what exactly is expected of them. And so that's why the church gives us positive precepts, not negative. They don't tell us what not to do. They tell them positively what we should do. It gives us an ideal to strive for, not a condemnation to avoid. You know, it, it, this really embodies to me the idea of church as mother, encouraging us and, and wanting the best for us, and not just condemning us. So on page nine of your activity book, uh, we have some more questions for reflection. And we're going to take about another, let's say, five to seven minutes to, to do this personal reflection here. And if you don't get through all the questions, that's fine. I really want you to kind of dig deep into some of these questions. Be specific. Uh, so what precepts do I find easy to follow? You know, which are the ones you don't have to think about a whole lot? Have you ever struggled with any of these precepts in the past? And how did you overcome them? If there was something you struggled with in the past that you don't anymore, what helped you to overcome those obstacles? And which precepts do you currently struggle with and why? So let's take five to seven minutes of personal reflection at our tables on these questions. In the time that we have before we uh, take our break for lunch, uh, I'd just like to invite anyone, if they feel comfortable, because I know sometimes some of these can be, uh, make us feel a bit uncomfortable to talk out loud about, uh, any of the fruit of their reflection here in this time. And I'll, I'll just share one from mine. The, the one I struggled with in the past, and I, I have to admit this is actually really embarrassing to admit, uh, was attending Mass on Sunday. Uh, right after I got out of college, uh, my wife and I, well, my, we, my wife and I got married, uh, moved to St. Louis, I started graduate school, and we had a real tough time transitioning. After being in college, where we had a, a campus ministry that was very much catered towards the needs of the college-age students, uh, to then be kind of thrust into a more adult parish, uh, where you know, we weren't being directly addressed in the homilies and the activities and the different things that were going on in the parish. Uh, and so we just kind of drifted away from a little bit. I, I say it's embarrassing, number one, because I just got my degree in, in theology, and was in graduate school for theology, and here I wasn't attending mass on Sundays. Uh, you know, I look back just with real shame of that. Man. Uh, and, and especially because as I look back, I realized what it was about was we were focused on us and what we were getting out of mass, what we were getting out of the parish. We didn't stop and think about, well, it's not about us. You know, it's not about what we get out of it, but about what we go to contribute, to be part of the community, to give worship to God every Sunday. And Thankfully, we had our first child and started to reflect on, well, what is it important for our children as they grow up? And, you know, I started to get pretty uncomfortable when Sunday morning would come around and we're kind of sitting there uh, thinking, you know, what am I teaching my, my infant son about the importance of going to mass, the importance of being, the importance of being part of the parish community? And so we had a real conversion. And I, again, I hate to even say that we needed that conversion. It's, it's something I really look back with and I'm just really ashamed of, that we let it get to that point. Uh, you know, we kind of need that kick in our pants that uh, having children always gives you uh, to get ourselves back into right priorities and orienting ourselves back to uh, a proper relationship with God. So that was one I struggled with for uh, about a year, year and a half uh, after we got out of college. So there's some space there for you, right? Um, I guess what I'd like us to start with um, before we kind of get into the subject of the attitudes. I'd like you to reflect on your current state of your life and write down all the pieces of your life, all the things that you're juggling, all the things you are. Which of those would you say to yourself, I'm just kind of going through the motions on this one? Would that be your work life? Would that be your church life? You know, you're there every Sunday, but more out of habit and you're just kind of rolling through the motions. Uh, at work, you know, you just don't love your job anymore. You've lost your enthusiasm. You're there because you need that paycheck. But you're just kind of working through the motions. It's your marriage. You know, you've been married for uh, X amount of years, kind of taking each other for granted. You're there every day doing what you do. But are you just kind of working through the motions? Your parenting. You know, if you've still got kids at home, you know what a demanding job that is. But it's kind of easy to veg out sometimes after a long, hard day at work and kind of let the kids do whatever the kids do. As opposed to positively parenting them uh, when you're tired. So I guess that, just for a moment there, reflect and 
see if you can say of this, of all the things in my life, this is the one where I'd say maybe I'm falling into a rut. It's my TV viewing habits. I'm in that rut, sitting in front of the same oh show over and over and over and over and over and over. Maybe it's my exercise habits, lack there. Obviously, an important message there for the, you know the, the chorus is I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. And that really should be our attitude. If you don't sit here today feeling that all-consuming passion, then you need to say, What do I got to do to get that? Where do you get that? Where do you sign up for that one? Because that's what I need. That's what I want. That's what people should look at us and say, where'd you get that? I want some of that. Because that's not what I see. That's not what I see. Christians on fire for the faith. Occasionally, you go to the right places at the right times, you know, you see that. But in the view on Sunday, standing up there with Father, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing passion. I'm seeing people that are there, which is something. Make no mistake, that's the cream of the crop sitting right there. But I'm not sensing passion. I'm sensing routine. I'm sensing going through the motions. That's not who we are. That is not who we were created to be. And that is not where we find our fulfillment. God did not create us to sit in the Barker lounger and watch TV till we die. That is not what He created us for. And so we got to say, well, what did He create me for? Well, He created us all for the same purpose, but He calls us each in a different and unique way to live out that purpose. To know Him, to love Him, to serve Him in this life. That's what we got to find. What is that thing I can be passionate about? What is that thing God created me to do in this time and in this place? And I think that's what this journey is about. That's what this year has been about, trying to help us all. Touch this, touch that, touch this, look at this, hear this, think this, so we can all find what is that? What is God saying to me? And if we haven't found that yet, okay, we just got to keep searching we got to find it because if you're breathing, God's got a purpose. God's got a plan. Our job is to listen, to hear it. And that's part of what I want to focus on this afternoon. But we want to talk a little bit about the Beatitudes to kind of finish up our talk on the law of the church, if you will, the rules. Because that's kind of how we look at all these little lists we get. Uh, some rules for us. And I, and I thought we'd start by just looking at what's going on here in Matthew's Gospel as, as the Beatitudes are revealed to us by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, just before, it says, He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness among the people. His fame spread to all of Syria. And they brought to him all who were sick with various diseases, and racked with pain, those who were possessed, lunatics and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, and Judea, and from far beyond the Jordan, followed him. When he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach. So here's the setting that the, that the Sermon on the Mount comes from. These crowds, Jesus has become a rock star, if you will. He's healing people. He's curing people. He's bringing hope. People are flocking to him everywhere he goes. The crowds are getting almost unmanageable. 
But the disciples are not part of the crowd. The disciples are the ones who have been following Jesus for some time. They're there to be taught by the Master. They're there to hear His every word. They're there to learn. They're not there because they're sick. They're not there because they're hungry. They're not there because they need to be cured or fed. They're there because they want to hear the words of the rabbi. So, he moves away from the crowd and sits. And his disciples come to him. And he begins to teach. That's what they want. But what he begins to teach, that is not what they expected and wanted to hear. He says to them, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the persecuted. These are not the sick, the hungry. These are not the persecuted. That is not who his disciples are. He does not, they do not want to hear, blessed are those people. They want to hear, blessed are we, the students of the rabbi. And he turns it upside down. So what we want to do is look a little bit about what's in those Beatitudes. What is he trying to really say to the disciples? Now, we have uh, the sheet that Sister gave us this morning. Hopefully you still have that. What I would like you to do real quick is look at the Beatitudes. The eight are there. Sister had you uh, share the Beatitude that is most manifest in your lives. The one that you share the easiest. This is kind of who you are if you had to look at one of those eight and say, this was me. That's what she asked you to share this morning. I'm going to ask you to do just the opposite. Which of these Beatitudes challenges you the most? Which of the one is the most difficult for you to understand and accept? Which one makes the least amount of sense to you? invite you to share that with the people you've been talking with this morning. You know, my spiritual director often tells me it's those things you're not comfortable with, Patrick, those are the things where you're going to find yourself. Those are the places you're going to find God. The things you're good at, you're rarely going to find God there because you think that's all about you. You need to look at the ones you're not so <laughs> strong in. Those are the ones you'll find God. So I would just encourage you now to maybe share with the person next to you. Which one of those? Uh, just so we kind of have a feel for where are we at? Which one of these make the least amount of sense? I think some very valuable insight into what God, what Jesus is trying to reveal to the disciples in this Sermon on the Mount and to you and I, of course. Uh, you know, first he looked at those positive ones that really have to do with that right relationship, that beginning of the Decalogue, that how do we get into that right relationship and what does that do for us when we do? Once we're in relationship with that love and, and receive that undeserved gift of God's mercy and love, we feel obligated, desirous of sharing that with other people. Once we've experienced that forgiveness, truly experienced it, then how can we not offer it in return? And then he talks about, blessed are those pure in heart, those who know without a doubt what is most important, why God placed them on this earth, and are singularly focused on accomplishing that to which they have been created. What a wonderful gift that is. That's how that passion arises in us. Once we sense what it is God is calling me to do, 
then my passion begins to rise up. And of course, it spills into every part of my life. Once I find that thing, that, that reason that I'm here at this time and at this place. Then he talks about spiritual hungry. You know, this, this uh, idea that um, in God we find our satisfaction. That that's what we come to realize. That it's only in God that we find our satisfaction. He's going to get into the negative ones and talk about why that is. Where our dissatisfaction comes from. Because we're trying to fill that void with something besides God. But the, 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 the beatitude is calling us to understand that that's where we're going to find it. That's where we're going to find our passion. When we get God at the center, then everything else makes sense. And then finally, that thing about peacemaking. And I think that's a good measure for all of us. As to how am I doing? How am I doing of living out this journey of discipleship? Am I a peacemaker? Am I the one who brings unity? Do I sow division? Unity comes from God. Division comes from Satan. All right, so then he gets into the four um, temptations, if you will, the four ways we all struggle, power, possessions, pleasure, and fame, if you will. Those things that attract us, those things that we believe, if we only have that, this hunger will be gone. And I couldn't agree with Father more. I teach, this is my mission, this is my passion, this is what God called me to do, to teach about this. But what I use when I'm talking about how God teaches us this, I talk about His first commandments to us, about being fruitful and multiplying, about keeping holy the Sabbath, about making a suitable offering. That's the antidote to the passion, the pleasure, the power, the fame. That's what draws us away from that. Now, it's not either or. It's both and. Those commands of God at the beginning in Genesis, that's what they call us to. These beatitudes from Christ, that's what they call us to. Throughout the scriptures, that's what God is warning us about. That's what He is calling us to. Detachment from the things that draw us away from Him. So I couldn't agree more. But my preferred way of looking at the Beatitudes is more in line with what Jeff Cavins would have to say about the Beatitudes. What he would say is the Beatitudes are not just some random list of things that Christ threw out there off the top of his head. That there is a very specific order in which he expressed them because they are the steps of the spiritual journey. The first of those, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This speaks of humility. It is first on the list because without the virtue of humility, we cannot acquire any of the other virtues. It's what, we, what I mentioned in my homily this morning, what we've been talking about. This idea of obedience. This idea of accepting the fact that there is a God, and I am not Him. That's where the spiritual journey begins. That acknowledgement in our hearts. Without that, none of the rest can be accomplished. The opposite of humility is pride. And pride leads to disobedience. The second, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, this has nothing to do with mourning the loss of something or someone we love. It has to do with mourning the realization of our own brokenness and inadequacy. Once we get into that relationship where we realize our responsibility, the reason we were created is to be in relationship, to be obedient to the Creator, we can't help but notice how often we have not been. And it is that inadequacy, that brokenness, that causes us to mourn. Which leads us into the next step of the journey. Blessed are the meek. Being meek does not mean being weak. It means that we have 
decided to submit our strength, our will to God. So while we discover in the first one that that's what we're called to, we realize in the second one we have failed and we make a resolution. We make a conversion experience. We make a change in our lives and say, I will submit my will to God. I am now prepared because I have realized who I am and where I am. Next comes, blessed are those who hunger for thirst and hung thirst for righteousness. Once we have submitted our will to God and we experience what that inflowing grace means, we realize there is nothing, nothing in this created world that can fill that up. Once it's been filled, it's like when we do a marriage retreat. We do a living in love retreat. We have some... some uh, flyers up here if you'd be interested in attending. We're doing one in January. And what, what ex couples experience of that is taking a good marriage to that next level. To a place they've never been. And once you've been there, you'll fall back. But you won't want to stay there anymore. That rut you were in will no longer be good enough. Because you've experienced something better. That's what this is once we've experienced that inflowing grace of God, nothing can replace it. Nothing will satisfy except staying with that grace. <clears throat> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The natural response to being in right relationship with God is to be merciful. I have received mercy. I must share it. God's mercy is flowing into my heart. I cannot help but share it. And as Father Barron reminds us, it's in sharing it that it grows. It's in giving it away that it multiplies. And we know this. You know, you know I've got a bunch of kids. Well, it's not like when we have a new kid, that means they each get a little less love. What that means is new love has entered our family and it's grown exponentially. It's not about rationing. It's about multiplying. And we get that. When we get into that place where God is flowing into us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In this growth process that the Beatitudes are calling us to, we become perfected, if you will. Our will and our intellect become attuned to the holiness of God. The way we were created. The mind of God and the will of God. We think like God and we act on those thoughts. It hasn't happened since the fall. Our intellect is darkened. Our will is weakened. But as we get plugged in deeper and deeper and deeper into that all powerful grace of God, we begin to think like God. We begin to act. Like God. Our intellect becomes brighter. Our will becomes stronger. And finally, or no, blessed are the peacemakers. Once we enter into the sonship, we will be called sons of God. Once we enter into this sonship with God, the peace of God is able to flow through us. When Christ says, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, they'll seem like nice words. And we don't really get them. Offer each other the sign of peace and you know, well, it's good to see you. Glad you're here today. That's not the peace we're talking about. We're talking about contentment. We're talking about joy. We're talking about desiring to share everything that's been gifted to us with all those around us. That's the peace that flows through us. And then finally, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness ultimate reward of this life is to be found worthy to participate with Christ in suffering for the salvation of the world. That's the ultimate gift that God offers. Pain and suffering. That's the gift. That's what all the work's for. So that you get to be part 
of the salvation of the world. Talk about the God sharing His power with us to create. God sharing His power with us to save the world. That's what Christianity is all about. That's what we are called to. If we are not feeling persecuted in pain, we've not reached that stage of the journey yet. There's work to be done. If they can't convict us of being a Christian, we're not there yet. We've got to stand up and proclaim the good news against the tide of the culture. All right. Well, that's my speech about <laughs> take whichever interpretation it is. It's basically Jeff Cavins, Father Barron, or wherever sisters came from. I forget the name of the book who wrote it. Those are three valid, equally enlightening uses of these sacred scriptures to teach and enlighten us. Which one speaks to you? I don't know. I think they all speak to us at a little different level. Alright, so the last thing that I want to talk about as we finish today is this notion of listening to God. You know, our final session next month is really about how is the Holy Spirit calling St. James and Patrick to move forward from here? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if you've got the answer to that question. I know God has the answer to that question. Let's ask Him what He has to say. I think that would be a great goal for all of us for the next 30 days. Seek God's advice. Seek God's will for the people of St. James and Patrick. And I bet if 40 of us individually seek that and we come together next month, I bet we'll hear the same thing from many people. Because God doesn't give out like 12 different messages. There's the truth. And He reveals it. And that's really what we want to talk about. You know, I, t I say things to my mother all the time like, you know, Danielle and I have really felt God calling us to step out here and do this. And she says things like, what are you saying? God talks to you? Because he doesn't talk to me. I say, yeah, Mom, God talks to me, and he talks to you. The challenge is to listen. And, and it's difficult in the world we live in, in the culture we've been raised in, to hear God. But he's speaking. Every day, every minute, every hour. He's talking. The challenge is how do we hear? What do we have to do? I think one of the most important things, I think maybe the most important thing we can learn is how to listen to God. You know, in our hectic and complex lives, nothing is more urgent. Nothing will take away that going through the motions and hearing God clearly speak to us and acting on what He says. Our God is not a speechless God. He's alive, He is active in our world, and He speaks to each one of us. He does not speak in riddles or mysteries. He speaks to us plainly so we can hear Him, receive His message clearly, and understand what He wants us to do. God is serious about His relationship with each of us. He expects us to respond to His voice to listen to His Word, and then act on it. God's Word is meant to transform us, to change us in some way. When it comes to our salvation, listening to God, I believe, is the most important thing that we can do. When we fail to listen to God, we open ourselves up to hearing other voices, to being deceived. The number one deception is always the same. We can make it on our own in this life. The world calls this independence. God calls it pride. The more we develop a relationship with God, the more we journey through these Beatitudes, the more we realize that we are utterly dependent on Him for everything. Our dependence leads us to seek an even closer walk with He who we are dependent on. And as we develop this more intimate relationship with the Lord, we begin to sense His presence always and everywhere. Once we get down this road, then we start hearing Him and seeing Him in places that people would say, crazy. 
This is not achieved in a day or in a single meditation. It is a pattern that forms over time. We must remember that our lives are always moving. We do not stand still. We are either moving toward God or we are moving away from Him. Hearing the voice of God begins with a commitment of time. The challenge is to always set us to, to find a way to set aside the worries, the frustrations, and concerns of our daily life and simply focus on hearing from God. Now, what I'm sharing with you is what I shared with my mother. You may be way past me in the journey, so just bear with me here. Think back over time over the here's the, the way I begin that process listening to God, by counting my blessings. I think back over my life, the past year, the last month, even this very day, and think about the times that God has protected me, that God has provided for me, that God has blessed me and my family. And this helps me to put whatever worries I brought to this time in perspective. To set them aside, to let them settle, while I just sit with God. And I would say one of the ways to know that we are experiencing God speaking to us is when, is when we begin to feel a sense of peace in that time. If we are facing a decision, we will no longer feel tossed and here and there, wildly between possibilities. We'll no longer feel restless and agitated. Our mind may not yet be certain, but we feel sense of positive attitude about whatever direction we are headed. A sure sign that we have heard from God is energy, a power, or a strength that renews our enthusiasm for life. My strongest recommendation to you is in your time, when you're spending trying to hear God, is keep a prayer journal. Identify the issues in your heart that are of greatest concern to you and commit them to writing. Write down the words or passages from the Bible that strike you or challenge you. When you sit before the Lord in prayer, write down the thoughts and images that continue to come to your mind. I think the command from God, listen to Him is vital to our understanding of prayer. One of the ways we describe prayer is communicating with God, entering into a relationship with Him. But what is the nature of that communication with God? Think about this with me for a moment. Let's say you signed up to take a class in auto mechanics, and you know nothing about repairing cars. Coming into the class, if you speak, my suspicion would be that it would be asking questions, and seeking answers. I suspect you wouldn't be trying to tell the teacher what you thought about how to fix a carburetor. It's because you're in the presence of an expert. You're seeking knowledge. You're seeking wisdom. That's why you signed up for the class. Well, our time with God should be no different. We've entered into the presence of the creator of all things, the maker of the universe, the expert on everything. Are we telling him what we think? Are we asking him and listening? Seeking the will of God must be the purpose of our existence and of our parish. If we follow that path, we will have a true encounter with the risen Lord, and it will forever alter lives. Bishop Sheen once said, he was teaching about the Magi, and their visit to the Christ child. He talked about the difficulties they endured and the perseverance they displayed en route to finding the Christ child. At the completion of their journey, after experiencing the presence of God, the scripture tells us they went home by a different route. And Bishop Sheen said, of course they did. Their life had been forever change. Of course, they went by a different path. That's what 
God is meant to do for us. Put us on a path we never dreamed of. We never imagined. How can you tell if the message that you just got is from God? That's what my mom wanted to know. Well, I would say this. The message will be consistent with the Word of God. The message will usually be in conflict with conventional wisdom. The message will often challenge our faith to rise to a level we've never risen to before. The message will call us to step out in personal courage to do what God has said. You know, the message of the world says, do what you want to do. Live for the moment. Don't worry about what other people say or think. Your experience and knowledge will tell you what's best. God says, live a selfless, self-giving life. Live with an eye to eternity. Seek godly counsel. Your experience and knowledge are limited. Trust. The Bible is God's foremost method of speaking to us, I believe. It is why the sacred scriptures are commonly referred to as the Word of God. Can you remember last Sunday's sermon? Can you recall what you read in God's Word yesterday? We would be able to remember if we were listening for what God had to say to us each time we heard those scriptures proclaimed, if we were taking seriously the reality that God does have something to say to me today from this scripture, what is it? In the book of Isaiah, God tells us that the word will not return to him void, but shall do all his will, achieving the end for which he sent it. St. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. And He did not return to His Father void. He did His Father's will in obedience. He achieved the end for which He was sent. The redemption of the world. Because the Word of God was obedient to the will of the Father, accepting even death on a cross, you and I have the opportunity to receive salvation through the forgiveness of our sins. While well, Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, the sacred scripture, the Holy Bible, is the written Word of God. What is its purpose? The same purpose as the Word made flesh. To make God known to us. To reveal the wisdom of God. To speak the truth into our hearts. To show us the way to live this life. To lead us to eternal life. So I believe my time is up. So I'm going to end it right there. But I would just have you all, uh, as we make the transition to Jonathan, what I would like you to do is write down right now, somewhere, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? What is your favorite story from the Bible? What is the one that speaks to your heart every time you hear it? And I'll just share for, for, for you the one that, that, that has spoken to my heart for 15 years. The very first time that I prayed the liturgy of the hours, we prayed the canticle of Zechariah out of Luke's gospel. And in it it says, You, my child, shall be called a prophet of the Most High. For you have been called to bring the knowledge of forgiveness, of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. That was John the Baptist that they were talking about, that Zechariah was talking about. But I can tell you, it spoke to my heart. It told me that's why you're here. That's why God created you. This is the reason. 
And it has forever changed my life. I don't know what that scripture is for you. I don't know what that word from the Lord is for you, but I know it's there. Search for it. Find it. <laughs> Let that be the passion that informs every moment of your life. Thanks.